Uh, children are going to go to the um, Sunday school now. And in a moment, when Wayne gets a chance of multitasking, he's going to come up and read to us. And he's going to read uh, from the Gospels, from uh, Matthew 27. So, Wayne, over to you. Our reading starts at Matthew 27, verse 57, and on to Matthew 28, verse 15. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were sleeping, while we were asleep. If this report gets the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Our God and Heavenly Father, this is your word, and we ask that you will open it up and speak to us through it. May it be a blessing to us all, whether by uh, encouragement or challenge, whatever, Lord. Let your word have its authority today in the power of the Holy Spirit, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. John Lennox, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics, Oxford, Emeritus Former uh, Fellow of Maths and Philosophy, of Science at Green Templeton, Oxford, holder of several doctorates, once said in a public interview, Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, was ahead of me in Cambridge. I can remember him quite well, although I didn't actually know him. 
But I was rather amused when the Times interviewed him about religion. He said, religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. I was asked to comment on it. So I said, atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. Well, I don't know what you think about that. Maybe it's a challenge for you. But really, when we come to the Easter story, we know it quite well, don't we? Most of us, I guess. We're fairly familiar with the the basic outlines, if not in great detail. And it's a wonderful story. But the real challenge, the hit of the resurrection, is that very fact of did Jesus truly rise from the dead? And of course, Humanity is divided on that. Many people say, well, no, he didn't, so therefore it's not a real story. And others would say, well, of course he did. So I want to really bring that as a challenge to you today. It is Easter Sunday morning, and it's a great Easter question. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? The whole authority of the Christian faith rests on the answer that we give to this question. And there are only two outcomes, really, aren't there? One, if he did rise from the dead, then the message must be true. It's authentic. And therefore, we must respond to it. You can't just bury our heads and ignore it and say, that's fine, it's all academic. No, it's actually a claim that he came alive again. On the other hand, if he did not rise from the dead, then the whole faith will collapse like a pack of cards. It's discredited. Listen to what Paul says. An apostle of Jesus says, with regard to this whole question, it's so important. Now, he's talking about other matters in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm not going to go into all the details of there. It's a question about whether all believers rise from the dead, and he says very much so, yes, they do. But listen to what he says in the course of that argument about uh, other matters relating to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13 says this. This is Paul arguing logically. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses, liars, about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised raised either, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep, I have died, in Christ are lost. If only for this life, We have hope in Christ. We are to be pitied more than all men. Do you see what he's saying? If there isn't a resurrection, then no matter what we say, no matter how much we shout, it's all a sham. It's just, it is a fairy story. But John Lennox, who was also an apologist and a Christian, is quite clear that it wasn't. And he was no intellectual imbecile. So the challenge is then, did he rise from the dead? Of course, the Christian resoundingly says, yes, he has risen. There's no body there. We just we read the account a little bit later, when, uh, earlier when Wayne read out. So that's the Bible standing. He did rise from the dead. And there's nothing else we can do about it, because if he didn't, then the whole faith falls apart. Saving Christianity has to be a supernatural Christianity. And we believe it is so. Now, there are three arguments that have been used, and I know many folk have come across these before, but it's important that every so often we do face up to these things because people are quite happy to say, I don't believe that Jesus died from the dead and I'm just going to shrug my shoulders and sit on the wall and not do anything about it. You can't do that because if that is so, then the whole of Christianity has to go. But if he did rise from the dead, you have to seek out the consequences of that. Now, there are three basic arguments. I'm not going to deal at length with the first two because they're not really worthy of much detail. But we will look at them briefly. The first one is the swooning theory. 
This is a, a way that's been put forward by so-called accredited academics who say, well, the problem is, that, or rather the solution is, Jesus didn't actually die. It only seemed like he died. He swooned or fainted. You know, like one of those Victorian ladies when they see the mouse coming in and they put their hand to their head and collapse and the maid has to come with the smelling salts. It's a swoon, a deep faint. This is actually a credible argument by some people. I don't want to deal with it in great length, but basically, just consider it for a moment. Basically, Jesus, they're saying, didn't die on the cross. He didn't really rise from the dead. And what they say was he went into this deep faint because of all the suffering he went through. And no one's denying that. If you read through the Gospels, you'll see that he went through an incredible um, pressure and pain. Remember, he was exhausted after several days without proper sleep. He was emotionally drained. He'd been to Gethsemane, which was a terrifying experience. He'd been bereft of friends, deprived of sleep and food and drink. And then he was taken, questioned, brutalized, savagely whipped. Uh, remember, then finally he had his beard plucked and he had a crown of thorns on his head. He had his face bashed. And uh, then he had to carry that cross. And as Jimmy very helpfully said on Friday, um, why were the Roman soldiers so kind getting someone else to carry the cross when Jesus collapsed? They didn't want him to die because he was already in danger of dying. He was so weak. He lost blood. But then they had to put him on the cross and put nails in his hands. And he had to stay there in the savage heat of the day for hours, suffering. And finally, of course, the Roman soldiers who were on guard there watching, they had to make sure he died properly. When they came at the uh, at late afternoon to make sure they, they were dead, and the only way you could do that was by breaking the legs, because then they would collapse and they would suffocate. That was the method of crucifixion. When they came to Jesus, what happens? They didn't break his legs. Why didn't they break his legs to kill him? Because he was already dead. But these people say he didn't really die. And these trained soldiers, killers who went into battle, one of the greatest armies we've ever had, and a centurion watching them to make sure they did it properly. And if they didn't do it properly, they could forfeit their own life or certainly be in serious trouble. So what does he do? He thrusts a spear into his side to make absolutely sure. But these people say he didn't really die. And then he's mummified, taken down from the cross, wrapped up, put in an airless tomb. With all that blood he's lost. And the theory goes, well, in the coolness of the tomb, he revived. The smell insults kicked in. It's a ridiculous idea, isn't it? That Jesus could have survived all that, not to mention suffocating in the tomb anyway. And, and to, to get up and to rise from the dead. He died. He didn't faint. Now, it's interesting, the other theory contradicts that one. It said, well... He, he did really die. And this is called the hallucination theory. It's all dressed up in very grand words, but basically comes to the idea that everyone who saw the risen Jesus afterwards, and there were many, they all hallucinated. It was mass hallucination. I'm not aware that this has ever happened in medical or psychiatric um, experience, case history before. I'll stand corrected if it does happen, that different people at different times were mass hallucinating. And if you read the accounts, you'll find that, it happened, that people saw the risen Jesus at different times in different groups. Sometimes it was one. Sometimes it was two. Do you remember the road to Emmaus? Sometimes it was a whole group of the disciples. Sometimes it went into hundreds. It was in the evening. It was in the morning. It was in the afternoon. It was at different times of day. Now, the argument here, of course, is that the disciples so wanted to have Jesus alive again that they convinced themselves that he really was alive again, and so they imagined and hallucinated and saw him. Well, I don't know what you want to think of that one, but it is really quite ridiculous. It's got no medical foundation at all. It's a, a rather strange idea to assume that people mass hallucinated in this way. Besides which, the idea is that they wanted to believe that. But most of these disciples were convinced he was dead. And they weren't looking for that. Remember the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. They, they were saying, oh, we, we thought he was going to be the same, but he's dead. They weren't secretly hoping they would see him again in some way. 
So I don't want to spend, as I say, it's not worth spending too much time on these relatively modern theories, but what really concerns us is the real one that seems on the surface to have some credibility is, of course, this idea that the body was stolen. This is the oldest theory, and it's still around today. The disciples stole the body. Well, let's look at it a little bit first, shall we? And we pick it up really in um, verse 62, where we get this um, challenge. So let's have a look and see what it says. First of all, there had to be a reason. This is what the Jewish leaders concocted together with the guards and the Roman authorities. The disciples stole the body. Problem solved. That's why there's an empty tomb. There's nothing in it all. Quite literally, nothing in it. Like that Easter egg. The reason. Well, the Jewish leaders knew what Jesus had said. It's interesting, actually, because the disciples seem to have forgotten that. Do you remember those two on the road to Emmaus? They seem to have forgotten about all the claims Jesus made about coming from the dead. But the Jewish leaders hadn't forgotten. I find that quite fascinating. They'd remembered the words that Jesus had spoken. And they knew that he claimed he would rise from the dead. Now, these Jewish leaders, remember, were divided. There were the Pharisees who believe in a resurrection, not necessarily that Jesus was the one, but they believe generally in resurrection. It was possible. They believed in the power of God. And the Sadducees, who were the opposite, they said, no, there's no such thing. And yet these two were able to come together. Such was their hatred of this man, Jesus. And so they really were concerned that in some way or other, the disciples might get him out. And what we have here is they're coming to the the Romans, in effect. Let's pick it up, what it says from verse... um, Sorry, verse 62. Here we are. The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees, most of the chief priests at this time were Sadducees, and the Pharisees, even that in itself is quite remarkable that they came together, went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, Jesus, said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, so we can break the promise of the prophecy. After three days, he said he would rise again. So make it secure. Otherwise, listen to this, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. And that last deception will be worse than the first. What an irony they talk about the last deception where they're doing the very thing themselves. And so, strange enough, Pilate agrees with them. And he says, go and get a guard. Get one of my guards. And uh, he answered, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. That's an important point. As secure as you know how. Go to the utmost. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. They were absolutely worried that uh, this should be undone, that this should all unravel. So they decide that this is what they will do. I wonder if Pilate really believed in the possibility of the resurrection. He seems very anxious to join in this conspiracy to keep uh, the, the tomb sealed, doesn't he? Well, what's the reality? What happens? Verse 20, chapter 28, verse 1. I'm not going to go into the details of it. We had it read. It's one of the great Easter stories. The women go and they find uh, the events quite unexpected. Just think about it for a moment, though. First of all, the facts. Jesus is dead. He's been put in a tomb. And a guard has been placed there. And it's been sealed with a stone. Look at verse 2. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. And the guards, listen to this, another important point. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Like dead men. So what was happening? There's a violent earthquake. Well, that in itself is a pretty dramatic thing, isn't it? And notice, it was a violent earthquake. And then what happens? There's an angelic appearance, and the stone is rolled away. We get, even get a description of the angel, don't we? Uh, he was, uh, his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. You know, these, these were hardened men, soldiers. Uh, they weren't believers, and yet they had this experience. I mean, the, the, the earthquake enough, I've never been in an earthquake, but I, I would gather it's pretty frightening if you're at the center of it. it. This is a violent one. It's not just a little tremor. And then this being appears. We, we're, we're living in the superhero culture of films now, aren't we? So we're used to strange uh, superheroes with lightning and so on. Imagine it, though. A man standing there, and he's, he's, he's like lightning. You know, there's all this lightning coming out of him. I mean, it would terrify anyone, wouldn't it? And what's the result? They shook. These hardened soldiers who faced the enemy, they shook, and they collapsed like dead men. They went into the swoon, not Jesus. And there they were. Presumably, they were unconscious, maybe, or, or at least in some kind of frozen terror, uh, maybe when they got to their senses, they ran. It would have been an absolutely horrific experience. Well, let's leave them for a moment because we've got the others who were then told, the women were told who seen this, that they were to go and share the good news, tell the good news, that he's not here anymore, he's risen. There's an empty tomb. Now, we need to watch this. These are the witnesses. They saw the tomb was empty. The guards saw the tomb was empty. And maybe there could have been other people around who would see that. I mean, lightning does make a lot of noise. Uh, Earthquakes do tend to attract people's attention. And this, this uh, angelic creature, maybe there were others around, we don't know. But certainly they knew. And so they go on and tell the good news. But let's get back to the guards. Now, if you pick it up in verse 11, it's very interesting. While the women were on their way, they're going off to tell Peter and John and the others, some of the guards. Now, we don't know exactly how many guards were posted. Some commentators and historians say that a Roman guard typically was 16. Now, if it was 16 men there, that's quite a spectacle, isn't it? Whether that's so or not, I don't know. There may have been a small number. I don't think it was the traditional guards that we get on these Easter films, you know, the two dozy guards that fall asleep. There certainly were more than two because it says some of them. So presumably there were some that didn't and some seems to speak of more than two. If one went to send the message to the others while the other one ran away or stayed there, then some seems to imply much more than that. There may have been four, there may have been six, there may have been eight, there may have been as many as 16. And they go and they tell the high priests and the Jewish leaders and you can imagine the terror they must have felt. What were they going to do? You see, their job was at stake. They could lose their lives. This is clumsy. This is hopeless. What kind of story are they going to say? A, a man appeared. There was an earthquake. And we, we were so scared. These are soldiers. Can you really imagine that? But they go, first of all, to Jewish leaders. They're too terrified to go to the Romans, hoping maybe that something can be worked out. And we get this passage, don't we? Verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Bribery. It's one of the oldest things in the world, isn't it? And to telling them, this, it tells you here, you are to say... His disciples came during the night and stole the body. The guards knew that's not true. But they also know that their lives are at risk. And so the money and the silence was far more important to them than the truth. They saw what had happened, but they lied. 
to save their own lives. And, and say, while we were awake, we were asleep. And notice this little touch here, verse 14. If this report gets to the governor, your governor, will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So that's how it started. It's the only, if I can put it this way, most credible of the three, although it's full of flaws, as we'll see in just a moment. So, the idea, the argument is, if Jesus didn't really die, uh, he, his body must have been stolen, because there's no body there. Everyone's agreed on that. So what happened then? Let's just consider for a moment the plausibility. Let's consider the, sorry, the possibility that disciples could have done it. I want to try and be fair. Consider the difficulties. First of all, these disciples we know from the text were terrified, were discouraged, were broken men. They were ordinary men. They weren't trained soldiers. They weren't in a position to do this kind of you know, thing that they could um, go in and, and steal a body. I think how complex that would have been with a Roman guard posted there. They had fear and discouragement. They certainly didn't seem to have any weapons. They, we were told earlier that there were a couple of swords about, and then one of them, when he had a sword, he didn't seem to know how to use it and ended up slicing someone's ear. Uh, they were just fishermen. They were not soldiers. And if there were any of them about, most of them had disappeared. Maybe Peter and John, perhaps certainly John was there, and Peter might have come, and maybe a couple of others had gathered. But then, if they overcome all that fear, they've got to overcome the guards. Now, we don't know how many guards they say, so it could be a lot harder than we imagine. What do they do? Do they have a pitch battle with them? With their two swords? Or maybe they've got a couple of clubs together? Trained men who knew that if they failed in this, they were for it. You know, what do they do? Did they have a pitch battle? Did no one see it? Was there no bloodshed? Did no one die? So how did they do it? Did the guards mysteriously fall asleep? Remember, that was the, pl- that was the, the, the um, question that they said, tell them that you fell asleep. There's no record of that. How would guards uh, have just fallen asleep? You can imagine they probably weren't very happy, the fact that they'd been posted there in the first place. Maybe they were due to go on leave, and you can imagine them talking, saying, why have we got to be in a cemetery on, a, on this day? You know, guarding this, this Jewish fanatic. He's dead. What's the big fuss about? They would have been awake and alert. And these disciples, what, did they creep up on them? Now, let's just suppose, let's suspend it for a moment, that somehow or other, these discouraged disciples with a couple of swords managed to get rid of all these Romans, Romans, highly trained Romans. They ran away or something, I don't know. Then they've got to get the stone moved. Then they've got to get the body out. It would have been incredibly heavy, wrapped up with all the bandages and the spices. And where do you go with a body when everyone's waking up? I mean, it's it's rather conspicuous, isn't it? Where would you go? Which place would you hide? You've got to dispose of the body in some way, bury it. Can you imagine the complications? Were there no other people about watching by now? People got up early in those days. And then more important than that, not only trying to hide the body and burying it, but to bury their conscience. Because, of course, if they had got away with this incredible act and managed somehow to uh, hide the body, then they've still got the problem of knowing that they are not telling the truth. They are lying when they say, yes, everyone, he's alive. When Peter and John look at each other, they think, well, he's not really, is he? We buried him. He's not alive, he's dead. And yet, we're told in later uh, Bible accounts in the history that these men lived proclaiming that he'd risen and died for that faith. How can you die for a lie? Many people will die for many things. We see it happening in Ukraine at the moment. Brave people who will die for their country. But will you die for a lie? Something you don't really believe? that you know isn't true? It makes the challenge of 
trying to believe this idea that the body was stolen, really, really rather ridiculous. So, the unavoidable conclusion. If there's no body in the tomb, and if we reject these silly theories, then Jesus did rise from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, as he said he would, then everything else he said must be true. If he said he was God, so he must be, because would the true God actually vindicate a liar? He said he'd come to save, so that also must now be true. He said that he would come to judge everyone, so that also must be true. He said he would come again, so that must, that must also be true. Now, if you consider yourself an unbeliever, and you may be here today, or maybe you're not sure where you are, how do you square this? How would you explain the empty tomb? And if it is true, surely you've got to deal with it. You can't just shrug your shoulders and say, I'm not interested. You have to objectively and honestly face up to the implications that Christ, everything he said is true. So it's all going to come true. And the resurrection proves that. If you want to know more about that, there's some booklets here. There, it's a very good book. It doesn't um, mention specifically only uh, the resurrection. It does mention it at the end. But is it true evidence for the Bible? I've left loads out there. Please take one. I'm, I don't want to know if you take it. I just would like you, if you do take it, to read it. Um, pass it on to someone else. It's got some very helpful thoughts about many issues that people struggle with in the Bible about being true. Uh, it doesn't answer it absolutely, but it gives a lot of indication and gives you an indication of where you can go if you want to search more. Is it true? Evidence for the Bible. They're out there, and I would urge you, just take one. But if you're a believer, well, rejoice in your risen Savior. You can stand on something which is absolutely concrete. There are men and women down through the centuries who've tried to disprove this very fact. They've written books on it. They've gone out. There have been journalists who've gone out to say, I am going to make it my life's ambition to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. There are many of them. And they all become Christians in the end when they search the evidence. It's incredible, isn't it? We need to know more about this. They end up becoming Christians because the evidence is overwhelming. This would be the strongest case in any court, in any land, in any time in history. It's unsaleable. So as if you're a Christian, rejoice in it. It means that everything here is true. And there's a hope you have. We'll talk more about that tonight. And... Uh, even in your hardships, you have this absolute truth. Jesus is alive, and one day he's coming back. And when you die, or whether he comes back, it doesn't matter which, you will be with him forever in heaven. That is the great truth of the Bible. And it's not a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. It's truth. It's evidence. It's history. Uh, do you not think someone could have thought up a way of finding the body by now? You know these archaeologists, the technology they've got now for discovering things? Do you think someone would not have thought, I'm going to disprove this. I'm going to harness all the best technology, and I'm going to get a team together, and I'm going to be backed by these millionaires who have it um, in their favor, and we're going to find the body of Jesus and deal with this problem once and for all. No one's done it. No one ever will succeed because there's no body there. The body of Jesus is in heaven. You'll never find it. It's not on this earth. It's not in the tomb. He's not here. There's no body there. He's risen. How can I just finally, finally finish with a plea to anyone who's closed their mind to it? Just think again. What if you're wrong in your presumption that he didn't die? The evidence speaks against you. But I do urge you, with all my heart, consider these claims. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious truth. Jesus is alive and risen. And we ask that you'll bless it to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.